All right. Um, there's a bunch more announcements. So first announcement, uh, teammates, uh, please try to start sitting next to each other in lecture because as we were just talking about before, the way the rest of this class is gonna work is like um, for another couple of weeks or so, we have uh, kind of lectures about, you know, kind of machine learning practice, but then we'll more regularly have like work sessions. So we'll actually use the lecture period uh, to do work on whatever your project is um, with the opportunity for Shu and I to kind of come around to the teams and, you know, find out how you're doing and what we can help you fix or whatever. Um, so make sure you bring laptops. Okay. So they are required kind of from here on out. Um, and when you come into class, try to sit near your teammate. Um, and let's see, I, I made a note. Hold on. What do I do with them? Um, And then, um, and then the other thing is uh, the syllabus. We got a little bit behind, so I'm going to update the syllabus with dates and stuff like that to move some things around. Uh, so just kind of watch for that. I'll post it to Piazza that I updated it. Um, but if you want to know when those uh, work sessions are, generally speaking, have them listed in the syllabus. Um, generally speaking, they're true. Not always, but generally. Um, and then, yeah, that's about that. Um, other thing I wanted to mention is because uh, I just had a question about it is that I use Gradescope for grading and Blackboard to kind of share or to do uh, essentially scoring. So you'll see like the ethics assignment is in both, but all it is is Gradescope is pushing grades into Blackboard. So now if you go to the grading center, it'll actually show you uh, what your current grade is based on those inputs. Okay couple of cautions on that okay one is it does not in real time take into account attendance or participation okay as well as it only pushes it across once we push it across so if you like had you know uh, like if i published them and then you know one of them was an error or something like that if, until i publish it again it'll still have the wrong stuff so just kind of take it with a grain of salt it should give you an idea of where you are um, but if you're concerned about it at all, uh, please just see me. Don't don't take it as necessarily gospel truth. Okay. All right. So as I assume, not all of you know uh, who's on your team. Um, I was going to kind of call out names and ask you to raise your hand, and then uh, try to put you together. Um, so if Shahaf and Dan could raise their hands, is Daniel here? No. Oh no, you're Daniel. He's and Shahaf is not here. Okay. Um, yeah, I really need to talk to him. So I wrote to him. If you see him, you're friends with him, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you see him, tell him to reply to my email. Um, so, okay. So, uh, and then Sam is also not here, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, okay. So Rafat is there and, uh, Hong Wang, are you on the team together? Did I get that right? Oh no, you're with Sam. Sorry. Uh, so it's Hong and Jack. Okay, so you two are, are now friends. Um, and then, uh-oh, uh, how do you say your first name? It's uh, Lou, but fish. Uh, Bai Sing? Yeah. Okay, Bai Sing uh, and uh, Nick. All right, so you were, that worked out well. Um, Keith and Chao Wei. All right, and Keith over here. So can you guys move so you're sitting next to each other? Um, you can pick where you like. Uh, it won't matter that much today. It's just kind of like to get used to it um, because it will, it'll be a lot easier when we do the lectures where it's like more like a work session um, and, uh, and I won't have to rearrange everybody all the time. <laughs> so let's see, I think I covered everything. Any questions? All right, cool. Um, so I think we can start, yeah. All right, so uh, today we're actually going to talk about uh, exploratory data analysis or EDA, um, which uh, is very hard for me to wrap my head around because it's also the acronym for uh, enterprise data architecture, which is what it's been in my head for the last, I don't know, 20 years. So every time I hear that acronym, I think it's the wrong thing. So um, for all of you in this class, it's exploratory data analysis. Uh, but before we get to that, let's talk about uh, sourcing data. Okay, so uh, can anybody tell me what sourcing data means? Like where you get your data 
Right, so where, where are you getting your data, okay? And, uh, and so here are some, some good ones, okay? So uh, UC Irvine, uh, you know, has have any of you used Kaggle? Uh, okay, so that's really cool. They have competitions and stuff. You can like win money. Um, so it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, you're, I think all accounts are free. You might be able to pay somehow, but I, I never have. Um, there's this open data registry by uh, Amazon, data portals. Uh, and what I'll try to do is give, actually put links in here. I'm, I'm trying to get this as actually just like a web page, but I haven't done it yet. Um, then this R data sets. Uh, and then uh, you know a couple more here as well. But then on top of that, Spark actually and the BU libraries have actually been collecting a lot of data sets as well. So we have a bunch of other stuff too that you might be interested in. Um, but like I said, right now there's not a good source to say here's a list of all the links. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, but I think you know there's there's tons of good data out there, um, sort of, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, who knows what scraping is? All right, how about you? Right, so generally speaking, it means, you know, pulling data out of a website. It's actually broader than that because it actually predates uh, the web to some extent. It just kind of means pulling data out, right? Like from whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, however, does anybody know what the problem with scraping data is? Or can be a problem? Yeah. So that's an easy problem in the sense that you might get really messy data. Um, in fact, actually, there's a bunch of tools that will help you solve this problem. Uh, if you're a Python person, Beautiful Soup is a great tool in this space. Um, but then also, if you actually use like Excel or like LibreOffice's equivalent, which is called Calc, or I think Google Docs does it now too. Um, but you can actually source from a web page uh, into those and kind of get it to extract the data with refresh, which is also kind of nice. Uh, what's the more difficult problem with data scraping? Anybody? Anybody else? All right. Yeah, okay, so one is uh, some websites will proactively uh, try to have countermeasures to people scraping their data, which is another technical hurdle. The problem I'm really going after though is that it's often illegal, okay? Like often, often, okay? So uh, for example, there was another class I just gave a, a, like a guest lecture for, uh, they wanna do a job application website, okay? And they need a source for those job applications. Their initial idea was potentially scrapeindeed.com. You know what Indeed really doesn't want you doing? Taking their data, right? Because that is what their, their secret sauce is. Okay, I think, I think we talked in this class, maybe, I don't know. So in open source world, right, the idea with open source is that the software is actually not that important, okay? But the data is, okay? And so you have to be very careful if you're scraping data uh, that you are within what's referred to as the T's and C's, or the terms and conditions of that data, um, you know, and you kind of have to use your own judgment, okay? So as it says here, right, um, there's other ways to get data as well, uh, but they're often not particularly legal. So if you do it a little bit for one little thing because you're curious about something, you can usually get away with it. You run a company against it or on it, not gonna go well, okay? You will get sued people discover it very, very fast, okay? And there's lots of techniques for discovering that someone's trying to scrape your data, uh, just as much as there are for ways to scrape data. So be very, very cautious, um, you know, and, you know, that's the nice thing about kind of these collections as well as, um, you know, kind of there's this whole open data movement as well, uh, so that you can uh, get sources of data that are legal uh, and, you know, are good to work with. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. How do you know if you're within the terms and conditions of a uh, website's data usage? Any idea? You basically just have to read the terms and conditions. If you're lucky, uh, they will use something called a Creative Commons license. Okay. So Creative Commons is an organization that has like easy to read and easy to use um licensing for content that isn't code generally speaking so for example 
Uh, it's kind of cut off here at the bottom here, but uh, I put it in almost all my slides. So it says all content here not owned by others uh, is CC by NC 4.0. Okay, and what that means is it's shorthand for Creative Commons um, by, so basically that means like um, uh, you have to indicate who, who created it, who you're sourcing it from, um, and non-commercial. So that's the NC is. So basically you can use any content in here as long as you attribute it to me um, and you're not using it for commercial purposes, okay? And so that's what the Creative Commons is. So if you go to creativecommons.org, you'll see all of their licenses. They're super handy. Um, and so sometimes a website will just have a tag like that, either on you know kind of the page itself or like in their about page. So you just kind of have to go dig around and figure out if it's legal. Uh, if you need help with that, feel free to let me know um, because you know I'm happy to help. I've been doing it for a long time, uh, and so it's it is uh, you know it's kind of a learned skill. <laughs> okay, so exploratory data analysis. Um, so uh, somebody who used to teach this class included this uh, graphic. Uh, in general, um, I'm sure you've all heard it before. Uh, or uh, the variant is, um, you know, lies, damn lies and statistics, uh, which is often, I think, misattributed to Mark Twain. Um, but basically, the idea is that, you know, you can present data in such a way that it can usually tell others what you want it to tell. Okay. So you have to be very, very careful that you're not doing that even by accident. Okay. And that can be a difficult problem to avoid. Okay, so something to kind of keep in mind whenever you're doing any of this kind of analysis, uh, not to either fall into your own trap of making a mistake and, and thinking that you're, you're doing the right thing, but confused. Um, and also that you're not publishing information that appears like, you know, uh, coming to a conclusion that is not necessarily valid. Um, I should have included another slide. I have a couple of great examples of this, um, but uh, we won't get into them today. So has anybody ever heard of exploratory data analysis? All right, so this is really just kind of a fancy way of saying, first, I need to understand what my data looks like, like what is actually there. And then to some extent, it covers kind of the cleaning of that data, okay? So um, let me see. Oh, I thought I had a formal definition written down, but I don't have it here. Um, of course, so, but the idea is basically that here's a kind of a mechanism that you should kind of take a look at in order to be confident that you understand the data set you're dealing with or sets that you're dealing with. Um, and the thing is that, as far as I know, there's no universal rule as to what exactly EDA is, um, in the sense that there are some things that a lot of people do but other people will do some things slightly differently and things the other way. And we're gonna go through some examples, so don't worry about it too much. But what I wanna reinforce to you is that the things I'm gonna show you are not necessarily perfect, okay? And may not be complete, particularly if you're looking at a data set that's weird, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind. This is, the idea is exploratory, right? It's not, it's not meant to be, here's a clear set of steps to follow. Uh, it's more general purpose, or it's more, uh, you got to use your own brain more than that, right? Um, all right, and so why do we care? Okay, so what are, we, what are we looking for? Okay, well, two big things. One, to make sure we actually understand what we're looking at, but then also that we're not um, kind of accidentally introducing uh, bad data into our outcomes, in a sense, okay? Um, so, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. So let me kind of stop with that there. And the how do we do it is what we're going to move on to. But first, um, this is why I kind of said it's like this, this cleaning part is, is like some of it's in the EDA, some of it's outside of it. It's a little bit, you know, rule of thumb, like how you prefer it. But basically you're pulling data in, right? Um, then you do some processing on it. Maybe you clean it. But then you do your, your EDA and kind of go back through a loop until you're comfortable with where the data is, okay? Or like the state it's in. Um, 
And some of that is not a hard and fast rule, okay? You have to use, this is where experience comes in, things like that. Um, but, you know, for a lot of the time, it should be relatively obvious. Uh, and then that's when you can kind of get into doing models and algorithms and all that, that real like data science or machine learning work. Um, and then communication out, right? Make decisions off of it, um, you know, or some sort of data product, but that you want to surface, you know, uh, Microsoft, I guess, just rolled out a gender identifier that works even with masks um, using uh, vision, you know, uh, facial recognition, which is kind of funny. Um, so, but that would be in a sense a data product, right? It, it, yes, it's still an API, but uh, it's, you know, the model and all that jazz is behind it. You just kind of get the, the output, if that makes sense. All right, so, One of the things to keep in mind, right, is like data is not information, okay? It's just data. So out of some level of context, right, with, with just what we see here, we know nearly nothing about like, is 44% good, right? Um, you know, in a sense, like if this applicants here is for a university, that's, you know, surprising because women are actually accepted in the university more often than men for example um but let's just say you know it seems whatever right um however if it was for like uh you know a nursing school this would be actually a really positive set of numbers because men inherit generally speaking do not uh, tend to become nurses um so you kind of like just data right like it doesn't tell you anything so you want to be really careful when you're presenting this kind of information, like nine times out of 10, there should be, you know, a paragraph above it, right? And a paragraph below it that tells you what you're looking at. Uh, if you can't embed it all in the, the document. Um, and then kind of, you know, by extension, we, we kind of looked at the same thing. It's like, just because we have more of it doesn't mean it's any better. Okay. Like we just, now we know even more about this thing. We don't know anything about. Right, so we just you need to make sure that every time you're thinking about these things that you're you're presenting the full context you're this is where the you know. Um, the you know lying with statistics comes in right is I can make this mean anything. Right, like I can just make up examples, whatever, um, and be perfectly happy. And then. This is a little bit just to kind of say. Like giving us a feeling of the data. And so this was just an example. I probably should have taken it out and just gone into the real example. But before we do that, well, sort of before we do that, how many people here are familiar with um, the SCC or the shared computing cluster? Somebody used it? Raise your hand. Okay, so uh, BU has this thing called the shared computing cluster, um, which offers a number of kinds of resources. Uh, straight up the ones that are probably the most useful to you right are things like a jupyter notebook okay um however you can actually get straight shell access if you want to do something in linux or you want to run python or whatever um there is our studio a bunch of these i've never even used on scc but you get the idea and so what you do here is once you have an account um you go into the interactive apps here and let's say you want a jupyter notebook then you kind of set up the various things that you want to set up, you know, what version of Python. Uh, this is a pre launch, so preload some uh, libraries that I use. Um, and then your working directory, and then anything else you want to put in. And then the big one to remember is the number of hours you're going to be using it. So just keep in mind that the server instance of the Jupyter Notebook has a lifespan, but your files don't. Okay, so anything you save in Jupyter Notebook is going to stay there on the server. You'll just have to start a new notebook instance to be able to access it. That makes sense. And you can even get to the files directly by going over here and you can actually choose your home directory and actually go and look at files um, if you need to do that uh, without launching a Jupyter notebook. But you go down here and then you click launch. Um, and I'm not going to launch it right now because I have one running already. Um, but then you'll be taken to this screen. And this box here will be, I want to say it's yellow or something while it's queued, but this, the big thing is this blue button won't be here, okay? 
until it's actually ready for you to use it. Then you just click on the button and bang, away you go. That makes sense? Okay, so if you think for this project or for your class, um, you want to use the SCC, uh, let me know and we'll get you access to it. Another big option you have um, is, um, i trying to remember the URL. Ah, wrong. So I don't use this very much, um, but it is available to you because it's part of your Google uh, Drive subscription with your BU account. Um, so it's just there. Uh, and what it is, is a way that you can run Jupyter Notebooks uh, through Google's infrastructure. So there's no setup. You can run a Python notebook or an IPython notebook, a Jupyter Notebook, just like you would in like uh, Jupyter Notebook or in the SCC. Um, but the barrier entry is a bit lower, right? Uh, and it just, any of your Python notebooks actually show up as if they were files in Google Drive. Does that make sense? All right, so it's just kind of two options. I don't expect you to have memorized what I just showed you. Um, it's more like, go Google it on your own if you wanna play around with it and try to figure it out. Or, you know, come and see me, shoot me an email, whatever, and I can get you hooked up into these things. Because one of the things that you're going to have to figure out first with these projects is like, how are you going to work on them? Um, and how are you going to work on them together? One of the nice things about the Google Play Lab is it's got a lot of the same features as like Google Docs in that collaboration on them is very nice. Okay. So might be helpful, but we'll have to, we'll probably want to figure out for each uh, of the teams what the best way to work is. But the reason I showed you all that was because not that at all. That's entirely the wrong class. All right, so that legible, can you all read that? You want me to make it bigger? Your thought, can you read it? Yeah, all right, sorry, bigger? Good. All right. So, I mean, hopefully I'm not showing you really anything new from a tech perspective. What I'm trying to just show you the approach that is a, a, let's say, common but not necessarily required approach to doing EDA, okay? So first thing is load some libraries. Then, uh, you know, you go get your data, whatever it is. Um, I happen to have a CSV file of a whole bunch of information about cars came from Kaggle. Um, I think it has like 10,000 records or so. Um, and look, it loaded nice and fast. Um, and so the first thing I kind of do when I start to thinking about, uh, you know, like data set is I kind of look at some sample rows, okay? One easy way is to kind of look at the top of it and the bottom of it, that's what head and tail are, okay? Is just kind of look at the both ends just to kind of get a sense of what's in there. Um, and almost more importantly, to figure out what I, I don't care about or what, what I can get rid of, right? Because every time you deal with one of these data sets, one of your first goals should be to try to get rid of as much information in it as possible because everything else will be faster later, right? So we do, so that was the head and then we have tail off the data frame. Um, but then the next thing we want to look at is, okay, let's look at the types of this data um, and make sure that the types match what we think they should be, okay? So for example, who knows what MSRP is? Yeah, so it's manufacturer suggested retail price. Um, and I would file that away because I promise you that acronym will come up for you again in the future. Um, but if you notice, that is a number here, right? It is common in data sets, whatever, for that to be a string. So the first thing you wanna do is kind of like, take a look at it, is this the kind of information I expect it to be? Um, and if it's not, convert it, okay? Um, or maybe go through some investigation further, but try to figure out, you know, if your, you know, if your horsepower, right, is, not a float, 
it's it's worth trying to convert it, but you might want to do some of the other things that we're going to talk about first uh, to make sure your data is sane. Um, one of the things I will tell you about doing any of this activity is you have to be very, very careful, okay? Because you can easily, by trying to do data cleanup of some kind or another, you can very easily introduce bad data rather than cleaned up data. That makes sense? Uh, one example, actually, let me, well, it's, I'll get to it in a second. Um, okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get rid of a bunch of data we don't care about um, by dropping a bunch of columns. All right, and then reassign it back into the data frame. So now we have only the stuff we care about, let's say, okay, um, in this data set of cars. Oops. But then there's another thing that I like to do, um, which I thought I'd already done this, but let me. It's much more exciting when you don't see the outputs. Um, so. Oh, I made a mistake. Um, okay, so one of the things that I try to do is I get rid of spaces in column names and capitalization because capitalization matters usually um, and it annoys me. So I make them all lowercase and I use underscores as uh, spaces. Um, and then I don't know, I try to be consistent, but I'm not always, but like I'll use a hyphen to indicate like a flavor. Um, and whereas an underscore is a space. Okay, does that make sense? So your mileage may vary. This may matter to you. It may not matter to you. Um, but for me, it makes my fingers work a lot better uh, because then I don't have to remember how it was, you know, was it cased correctly? Is it, you know, whatever. Um, the big thing I do suggest though is, is try to make it consistent. Um, and as you can see, I, I missed the first three columns. So whatever, call it a day. Um, so there's that. All right, so the next thing we look at Right. And keep in mind, right, this is a little bit arbitrary in the order I'm doing things, but you know, you get the idea. Um, okay, so first of all, I take a look at the shape of whatever it is that I'm dealing with. So we have about 11,000 or almost 12,000 rows and about 10 cops. Um, and now we want to know is, is there duplicate data in there, right? So and in uh, this larger data set, it's not uncommon, right, to have just duplicate data. Now, this is one of those places where you start to be cautious, okay? Because is a duplicate a duplicate or is it another instance? And depending on the data set you're dealing with, that distinction matters, right? Because sometimes it is just, you know, got into the data directly, and so therefore it's duplicate. But other times it's because, you know, it really is just a different instance. And even though it's listed twice with all the same data, if the analysis that you're trying to accomplish cares about that, you gotta be careful, okay? Uh, so this gives us, you know, 989 dupes. Um, and then we try to make sure that like what we, what we think is gonna happen is going to happen. So then we kind of go back and drop the duplicates um, and start to look at like how many did we have at the end of this process? Okay, you know, does, does this look right? Is this what we expected? Is what I was saying before is you wanna go back, you wanna make sure that the cleaning you're doing is actually cleaning. Are you actually removing duplicates, that kind of stuff. Um, so cross-checking is always really important. Um, another thing about this activity, which I probably should have said at the beginning, this is the kind of documentation you want to keep when you're trying to present whatever you're building to someone else as well. Okay. So that somebody else who, you know, has a different perspective or whatever, when they come along and look at it and they're like, wait, you deleted the duplicates. That's, you know, that's insane. And here's why. Right. So it's always good to get other perspectives. The only way you can get other perspectives is if you, you know, kind of, you know, what, what we used to call in like elementary school math, you know, showing your work, okay? So make sure you show your work. You don't delete all this stuff just because it worked. And I usually keep the cross-checking in, okay? To show what cross-checks I made um, and what I may have missed, right? All right. So the next big weird thing 
And mind you, we're still in that kind of cleaning phase still at this point. But the next big weird thing is the concept of a null, okay? Um, and so are y'all familiar with the term null? Okay, so can anybody here tell me what a null is? So sort of, right? Okay, so the, the distinction and the fact that we can't necessarily say what exactly it is, is important, okay? Why is that important? Because a null is not the same, and this is where I'm gonna quibble over terminology, but not the same as nothing in the sense that it's not necessarily zero, okay? It's also not necessarily missing. It's kind of this unknown state, okay? And that's why they're so difficult to deal with um, and why in a data set like this or whatever, you will have no values is because for whatever reason, that cell is null, right? It's, we, we don't necessarily know why it's null. So if you have a good, oh, does anybody know, I've ever heard of uh, what's called a data definition? Is that a term that people still use? Okay, so um, when I was taught all this stuff or whatever we used to call, there, there was a data set, right? And then there's always a file that explains the data set. Um, at Kaggle actually has a really good way of, of seeing these or whatever. Um, but I was, I was taught to call that a data definition. Um, and so, uh, but basically it just describes that data set. And a good one will say, if you find a null in the you know, cylinders column, it means this, okay? And give you the, the set of possibilities which hopefully is a you know one thing, but sometimes is more than one thing of what it can mean. Okay, so in this case, we're going to kind of make the argument that they're um, they're just missing. However, we're going to whack them rather than deal with them. Okay, so and this this is sometimes the right choice and sometimes the wrong choice, but we're going to say you know what we're going to consider that invalid. That makes sense. Um, and, you know, again, before and after to make sure we do what we think we're doing. Right. And so now we're back to now we have all of our rows are the same or sorry. Yeah. Like we have the same number of rows for every column. I mean, yeah. Right. Am I saying that? Right? Yes. Um, so that means we got rid of those nulls. We dropped them out of our data set. And then you know, kind of a, a mathy cross check. Um, and we see that it is all zero, um, you know, might be worthwhile to do, you know, more counting or that it looks right, you know, before and after, but you get the idea. All right. So the next problem is outliers. Okay. Why are outliers a problem? Ideas? Yeah. Perhaps it could be an indication of the uh, like data. Right, so it can often be an indicator that the data was collected poorly, right? Um, you know, transposing digits, for example, right? Or um, but I just saw a really good example of it. Now I can't think what it was. Um, okay, but so what? So if it's faulty data, let's say it is for the sake of argument. Why do we care? Like, what what's wrong with having an outlier? Especially if they're bad outliers. Go ahead. Skew your analysis for the data. Right. So it can skew your analysis. Um, so, right. Uh, so if you take uh, like the mean, right, for example, it's going to be really messed up if you have outliers in there, particularly if they're faulty. Um, so, again, going back to got to use some judgment here. With outliers, you have to think about whether they are. Um, legitimate in a sense to remove okay so if you're going to make the argument that they're faulty that's one or you can sometimes make the argument as what you care about in this analysis is the you know happy center of the data set then it's also fine to get rid of the outliers right but the first thing we got to do is we got to find them um, and one of the techniques is to use this cool thing called a box plot does anybody know what a box plot is? 
may tell us what a box was. Um, I really actually, I kind of expected more of you to know what it was, so I don't have a slide for it, but yeah, go ahead. Right, so it shows, it, it's almost like, um, you know, like a standard deviation graph kind of thing, except it's boxes. Um, and so it kind of shows you where is the, the middle of your data and shows off the outliers. So here you can see there's quite a lot of outliers out here, okay? And, that, and our little box is pretty squashed up. Um, and maybe, so this was a little nicer, right? And so this is kind of the middle of our data, right? And then we kind of have the outside edges, okay? Um, and so if you think about it as the standard deviation kind of model, um, you know, these are very clearly, uh, or uh, they're very clearly outliers and likely faulty data, right? Or if we want to, if we care, like if we're trying to say, you know, what is the average, uh, you know, price point for a certain level of horsepower, right? Then, um, you know, we probably mostly only care about the data that's kind of in the center. Does that make sense? So again, depends a little bit on your analysis. Um, so, but here's another one using the number of syllables in the, the cylinders in the car. Um, you know, so a four cylinder car, six cylinder car, that seems pretty unsurprising. Looks like we've got, I think it's, hey, is it trucks also have a lot more cylinders too, right? I don't know, actually know that much about cars. Um, but so maybe there's a truck that's in the mix here or, uh, you know, or some sort of Bentley or Aston Martins out here with 16 cylinders. Um, so again, might be relevant, might not be relevant, but we need to know that they exist and then make, you know, intelligent decisions about whether or not we want to keep them. Um, and what I would recommend is, you know, put in that paragraph here that says, decided to get rid of outliers for cylinders because I think that the 16 cylinder thing is actually a truck, you know, or whatever. Um, all right. And then there's also kind of a, a mathy way of doing kind of the same thing, which is the inter, in, interquartile range, right? Or intra, inter. Uh, interquartile range, um, often abbreviated to IQR. Uh, and so it's kind of telling you the same information, except uh, not using the graph, right? Um, and if you, and maybe I'll, I'll kind of find a reading or something for it. Like I said, I expected more of you to know more what these were, um, but I'll try to find a reading or something that can kind of give you a little bit more backstory. Um, all right. Now we want to essentially ax the outliers, okay? Um, and so that's what this function is doing here. And then it's telling us, okay, so, so what do we got left, right? So doing a little bit of cross-checking, probably should have done a bit more to make sure that we know what we're doing is correct. But here we're gonna ax those outliers uh, and get a new table that has, you know, mostly mostly that centery stuff, okay? Not yeah. All right. So then what we also start to do is, okay, this is where now graphs start to come in handy. Okay. Um, and so this also gets really difficult to kind of give you a broad spectrum answer um, because it's also going to be data related. So but what we want to do is start to look at, um, you know, try to analyze this individual set of data, you know, so we look at some of the categorical data to try to figure out, okay, well, what, you know, what kind of cars do we have in here? What, you know, um, uh, and, and yeah, I don't know, I guess that's what I was going to say. Um, but then we can also do things like, develop heat maps to try to figure out where, like, where are the interesting things happening, okay, in this data set. And that's what this heat map is going to try to tell us about the between the different, um, uh, the different attributes of these cars, okay, so that we can kind of see them, you know, kind of their score uh, between the different, uh, yeah, attributes. sorry, I, I keep blanking the word attributes there. Uh, so, 
But here, this, in a sense, really, this, in my mind, right, this is where we're getting into the analysis part, right? So it's difficult for me to kind of say without a whole lot of context, like, why? You know, like, in the sense of, it depends on the problem we're trying to solve, right? We want to look at, you know, we're trying to look for, like, correlations and relationships and that kind of stuff between the different aspects of it, because either we're trying to, you know, find the answer to a particular question, or we're trying to come up with questions that we want to ask. Um, but that's why we start to look at things like the heat map. Um, and then the other one that is tends to be really useful to show those same kinds, uh, show relationships um, and, you know, kind of opportunities for further investigation is with using scatter plots. Um, so I assume you're all familiar with, you know, at least scatter plots and histograms and uh, bar graphs, right? Um, but maybe you haven't played around with heat maps before. But this is where, uh, you know, it's kind of like knowing what's in your toolbox and what's available to you to try to look at the data to try to understand where the different things belong or what the relationships are can really lead you to the kinds of questions you want to ask. Um, because a lot of the time when you're doing this kind of work, you're, you, you often don't have like a nice, easy set of questions that somebody wants to know the answer to. Instead, you have kind of a data set and somebody wants to know what's interesting here, okay? Um, and so that's why we start to use some of these tools. Um, this went a little bit faster than I thought it was going to, so we're, we're, we're almost out of content for the amount of time we have today. Um, but let's see. Yeah, I don't know, does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? All right, so like I said, I'll try to find, uh, uh, like I said, a reading or something to do on box plots and IQR um, so that we can get you a little bit more familiar with them because I think they're, uh, so like the box plot, I think is super interesting, right? Because it really does tell you very easily kind of about those outliers and, and what might be going on with them. Um, and then if you're unfamiliar with any of these graphs, this is something you should probably read up a little bit on, on your own. Um, I, as I often say, Wikipedia is sh shockingly good for most of this kind of content. Um, so that's a good place to start. Uh, or, you know, let me know and we can find you better stuff. Um, because if you are terribly familiar with them, you'll be losing that tool in your toolbox. Um, the, the other thing is, I would say is like, and maybe we could do this as an exercise, we'll see. Um, but it's kind of like, it's nice if you come up with your own method of doing EDA, maybe it's informed by other people, but you know, the idea being is like, this is the way I do it because this is the way that makes the most sense to me um, and the way I take my first stab at this kind of problem. Um, so developing something like that is very useful to yourself. Um, so I don't know, Shu, would you agree that there's no necessarily right way to do EDA. Yeah, yeah. all right. So um, like I said, it's a little bit of a matter of opinion. I think there's a lot of people who, who think their way is the right way. Um, but uh, this, is, this is my opinion, that I think your way is the best way and that you should be doing things that help you understand what you're trying to figure out. Um, and then the last thing is on that data cleaning stuff. It is super dangerous. Okay, just be really, really careful um, because don't, you know, you don't want to make assumptions about the data because you think things like nulls are just zeros or whatever, because that's not necessarily the same thing. But I think that was it. Unless anybody had any questions, uh, y'all get, I don't know, half an hour back. Look at that. To go stand in what looks like it's raining out. All right, cool. Uh, and then I'll just reiterate. So whenever you come to class, please try to sit with your teammate. Please make sure you bring a laptop. Uh, I will be updating the syllabus, um, hopefully today, but it might be tomorrow, uh, but I'll post a Piazza note when I do it. Um, we have a guest lecturer for uh, next week talking about uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, we'll also talk about containers and then something else. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the syllabus will tell you as soon as I, I fix it. All right, uh, then let's call it. Um, oh, the only thing is, I would like to talk to you and you, um, at, like when we're done. Um, and Shahaf is still not here, right?